Greetings and welcome to our discussion of Kingdom Living in the time of the COVID-19 pandemic. Between around-the-clock news reports, reports of the number of latest victims of coronavirus, interviews with public health experts and pundits hashing out the pros and cons of different disease-fighting strategies, we're hardly at a loss for information and perspectives on COVID-19. Yet there are still many questions that we struggle to answer with complete confidence. Why has this happened? What should we do in response? And where is God in all of this? In God and the Pandemic, a Christian reflection on the coronavirus and its aftermath, theologian and author N.T. Wright shows how the scripture speaks to our confusion and uncertainty. John C. Lennox examines the COVID-19 virus in light of various belief systems and where is God in a coronavirus world and shows us how the Christian worldview not only helps us to make sense of it, but also offers us real hope to cling to. In our first session, we got started with defining and understanding about the coronavirus and kingdom living. We followed Wright's chapter in session two, reading the Old Testament by expanding our understanding of the biblical world and were supplemented in our focus of the importance of lament uh, by the voice of Walter Brueggemann, respected Old Testament scholar and world-renowned theologian. And finally, in session three, we studied Jesus and the Gospels to deepen our understanding of the kingdom as we have learned how Jesus redefines what it means to say that God is in control, that God is taking charge. The modern world has uh, suddenly become reacquainted with the oldest traveling companion of human history, existential dread and the fear of the unavoidable, inscrutable death. Until only recently, no vaccine or antibiotic would save us. And because this experience is foreign to modern people, we have been and are by and large psychologically and culturally under-equipped for the current coronavirus pandemic. To find the moral resources to tackle COVID-19, both its possible death toll and the fear that stalks our communities alongside the disease, we have to look at the resources built in the past. Christians have handled the plagues of the past and while people of all faiths and none are facing the disease, the distinctive approach to epidemics Christians have adopted over time is worth dusting off. And so with Wright and Lennox, we ask, what is the rest of the New Testament, and in particular the rule of the Holy Spirit, have to teach us about our response to the pandemic? As Wright notes, the New Testament refers back constantly to the great foundational events of Passover, the time when God rescued Israel from slavery in Egypt. He notes that Jesus himself made Passover central to his work of announcing God's kingdom and to his vocation to go to the cross. What Passover is about, and the Lord's Supper as well is, as Walter Bergman says, is the news that we are profoundly cared for in a world under threat. The Christian response to plagues begins with some of Jesus' most famous teachings. <clears throat> do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Love your enemies and your neighbor as yourself. 
Greater love hath no man than this, that he should lay down his life for his friends. Put plainly, plainly, the Christian ethic in a time of plague considers our own life must always be regarded as less important than that of our neighbor. N.T. Wright emphasizes the example in the Gospels of Jesus standing at the tomb of Lazarus weeping. Somebody who isn't a Christian might ask, what good is a weeping God? Anybody can weep. What we need is action. We need something done. How is Jesus crying? How does his weeping help? We answer that there is plenty of action in the story, and the action grows out of the tears. In fact, they are the crucial element. They show that the God who made the world, who became human as Jesus of Nazareth, is not sitting upstairs somewhere looking down and saying, okay, I'll sort out your mess. Rather, he's the God who comes and gets his hands dirty and gets his hands pierced in order to be where we are and to rescue us from there. God has not remained distant from human pain and suffering, but he himself has experienced it. And he continues to do so. In the same way, the Spirit also helps in our weakness because we do not know what to pray for as we should. But the Spirit intercedes for us with unspoken groanings. Because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. It's profoundly comforting to know that when I'm grieving, as Paul says in Romans 8, Jesus is grieving with me and the Holy Spirit is grieving with me. And this is one of the things that marks out the Christian faith as distinct from pretty well any other worldview that I know. What does the rest of the New Testament, and in particular the role of the Holy Spirit, have to teach us about our response to the pandemic? Romans 8 is one of the greatest passages in the whole Bible. Romans 8 is full of glory. It is full of salvation. It's full of the work of the Spirit. It's easy to get carried away. And imagine that once we're through the difficult parts of Romans 7, we're just sailing on a high all the way to Paul's affirmation that nothing can separate us from the love of God, as is in Romans 8, 38 and 39. But you still have to go through the dark tunnel of Romans 8 and verses 26 and 27, which speak of the Spirit interceding for us in our weakness. When the world is in a mess, as it is in general, but particularly at times like now, it would be very easy to imagine the church standing back and saying, what a pity the world's in such a mess, but we at least know the answers. But no, Paul says that when the world is groaning in labor pains, then even we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, the stirring of God's new creation within us, are groaning as we wait for our adoption as sons and daughters, the redemption of our bodies. You might say, okay, so the church shares that the world is in a mess. But surely God knows what he's doing. Well, in a sense, yes, God knows what he is doing. But here we strike the mystery of the triune God. Because Paul says that at that very moment, the Spirit groans within us with inarticulate groanings. Furthermore, according to Psalm 44, one of the great psalms of lament, 
Paul says that the God who searches the heart knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people according to God's will. In other words, God the Father knows the mind of the Spirit. But the mind of the Spirit is the mind that has no words to say for how terrible things are right now. This puts me in mind of the great German anthem of thanks. Now thank we all our God. The best loved hymn of German evangelicals was written by Pastor Martin Reinhardt during the Thirty Years' War as a table grace for his family. Listen to it. Now thank we all our God with hearts and heads and voices who wondrous things hath done in whom this world rejoices, who from our mother's arms hath blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love and still is ours today. And may this bounteous God through all our life be near us with ever joyful hearts and blessed peace to cheer us. And keep us in God's grace and guide us when perplexed and free us from all ills in this world and the next. The context of his work, not unlike our own, was a scene of relentless death. And yet Reinhardt wrote and sang a thanks. The hymn celebrates the wondrous things done by this bounteous God. The hymn invites us to cling to God's grace that frees us of all ills in all imaginable futures. The point is to engage in relentless, uncompromising hope. This is more than a civic assurance that we will get through this. It is rather the conviction that God will not quit until God has arrived at God's good intention. There is a purpose to work in with under and beyond our best resolve. The purpose is tenacious, steadfast, and relentless, that we and all God's creation will come to well-being. The task of the church is to hope in a way that is grounded in the good, faithful resolve of God. Right leads us to one of the most important passages in our whole quest for understanding how, as followers of Jesus, we should approach the question of the coronavirus. We stand again in awe before one of the greatest chapters of Paul's greatest letters, Romans chapter 8. As noted, Psalms of Lament are foundational for Right as in Paul's language in Romans 8, of humans groaning together with the entire nation as the Spirit intercedes on our behalf with groans too deep for words. Wright underscores the importance of Christ to God that cannot be deciphered and are meaningful precisely as such. He says, Not only do we, the followers of Jesus, not have any words to say, any great pronouncements on what this all means, to trump it out to the world. The world, of course, isn't waiting eagerly to hear us anyway. But we, the followers of Jesus, find ourselves caught up in the groaning of creation. And we discover that at the same time, God the Spirit is groaning with us and within us. That is our vocation, to be in prayer, perhaps wordless prayer, at the point where the world is in pain. This call to prayer, in the midst of what we do not comprehend, 
remain central to Wright's response. Other meaningful and purposeful work will emerge from the cries of God's people. The work also will entail signs that go beyond words and sighs too deep for them. We are called to be sign producers for God's kingdom, to set as signposts actions, symbols, not just words which speak like Jesus' signs of new creation, of healing for the sick, of food for the hungry, and so on. <clears throat> there are two tensions that run throughout Wright's book. The first is between Wright's moving call for the church to, say, to serve and heal the world with cruciform love, on the one hand, and his claim that this service becomes a sign of Christ's primacy on the other. Wright focuses on Romans 8, verse 28, typically translated as, all things work together for good to those who love God. But if he cast it in this way, our consolation in times of crisis would be indistinguishable from the Stoic acceptance that God is in complete control and so things will work out fine, which renders the Greek synergo as God working with, I should say right renders this word, as working with humanity rather than unilaterally for humanity. God works all things toward ultimate good with and through those who love him. I find edifying Cranfield's translation from the Greek, and we know that all things prove advantageous for their true good to those who love God. Christians are called to hard work, teaching, healing, feeding, comforting, caretaking, as you have done to the least of my brethren knowing that it is God who is at work through them. To be sure, at present we experience sufferings and groans, but we are sustained in the midst of them by the hope of glory. So far it's only a hope, because it's still future, unseen and unrealized, but it is not on that account uncertain. On the contrary, our Christian hope is solidly grounded on the unwavering love of God. And so the burden of Paul's climax in the, is the eternal security of God's people on account of the eternal unchangeability of God's purpose, which is itself due to the eternal steadfastness of God's love. But Wright also insists that this other regarding work of the church, witnesses to Christ, and this is ultimately about making disciples. As the primary rejoinder to those who find biblical signs and wonders in the coronavirus, Wright repeatedly lifts up Jesus as the ultimate sign, and sign par excellence of all that the one God has done and the gold standard for how we think about providence, suffering, and new creation. Few Christians, I think, would disagree. A second tension is related. Right at his best prompts us to suffer faithfully, knowing that in our cries we are comforting, uh, comforted by a wordless advocate, working for and with us. He reminds us not to rush, rush past our faithful lament for the pain of the world. Of course, sighing with the Spirit and suffering alongside the Messiah do not entail the final word. Glory awaits, and Wright uses Paul's words of rising with Christ to emphasize a stable of his uh, biblical theology. Namely, that the end goal, goal is not bodiless life 
in an ethereal heaven, but a new heaven and a new earth, which is no less bodily or physical for having corruption, death, and decay purged from it.